going on a treasure hunt. Got my sunglasses. Got my sunglasses. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. Oh, look at those grassy dunes. They're so tall. We can't go over it. We can't go over it. Hey, yo, Jimmy from Country Diggers here. Today we're going to do a little history on Captain Henry Morgan, the man behind the label. Now, um, Kevin from Traveling Bottle Digger, I know he drinks Captain Morgan some, so um, I'm going to do, if he doesn't know the history to Captain Morgan, I'm fixing to tell him. <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, I got. I also got a bottle here, and also right, this is my Captain Morgan bottle. Right here, it's spi original spiced rum. It's got the swords right there, the Captain Morgan swords, Captain Morgan right there, and it's also got like his ship right there. So. This is a pretty nice bottle. Uh, I know it's kind of modern. They didn't uh, bring the spiced rum to the United States until 1984. So I really don't know exactly how old this bottle is. Um, I don't know. But anyway, we also have a mail call by Mary Kay's Treasures. She's a relatively new channel. So if y'all hadn't checked her out yet, go check her out and we'll have a mail call at the end of the video. All right, y'all. All right, this is uh, a history on Captain Morgan, the man behind the label. This is from, I got this article from Weird History on Ranker.com by Geneva Carlton. All right. When you hear the name Captain Morgan, images of bros posing with a handle of spiced rum with one foot dangling precariously in the air probably come to mind. While there were plenty of pirates whose reputations were built on boozing it up with bar winches, a la modern rum guzzling frat boys, the real Captain Morgan is not one of them. Sir Henry Morgan doesn't sound like the name of one of the most terrifying pirates in the Caribbean, but the ruthless Captain Morgan propelled himself to fame and riches by terrorizing his enemies and seizing a fortune in gold from the Spanish. The history of piracy is full of surprises, and these Captain Morgan facts are no exception. Morgan was the son of a Welsh farmer, but he wasn't destined for a life on the farm. Instead, Captain Morgan crossed the Atlantic and became the most famous privateer of the 1600s. He became the leader of a powerful group of pirates called the Brethren of the Coast, he led an army of pirates against the Spanish, eventually capturing the second largest city in the Western Hemisphere. And Captain Morgan didn't waste all his gold on booze and winches. He used his money to buy up huge amounts of land in Jamaica. Once he became rich, Captain Morgan retired from piracy to become the governor of Jamaica. After years of terrorizing the Spanish, Captain Morgan became a pirate hero and one of England's most famous men, and he did it all by looting and pillaging. Was Captain Morgan real? Definitely. And his buccaneering earned, earned him a spot on the list of histories of the history's greatest pirates and an unlicensed mascot mascot deal for one of the college freshmen's choice liquors. Captain Morgan used nuns to capture a Spanish fort. Did y'all know that? Morgan wasn't exactly a pirate. He was a privateer. Licensed by the British government 
to attack the Spanish any time the two countries were at war, which was pretty much all the time in the 1600s. So technically, when Captain Morgan raided the fortified Spanish town of Porto Bello in 1668, it was completely legal. In spite of the numerous guards, Captain Morgan was able to use a clever tactic to take the town. He used the Spaniards' Catholic faith against them. The captain anchored his ships far away to, can to conceal his attack and struck at night by canoe. Two of the three forts quickly fell. To take the third, Morgan used captured nuns as human shields, taking the city and a handsome pile of gold for his troubles. Captain Morgan ransom ransomed an entire town for a fortune. Capturing Porto Bello was only the first step. Captain Morgan knew the Spanish would pay dearly to get the port back, as well as all the gold and silver from Peru passed through Porto Bello on the way to Spain. Captain Morgan sent a ransom note for the entire city to the governor of Panama. He demanded uh, 100,000 pieces of eight, the Spanish coin-based currency of the time, which some people have uh, dug, and I'm hoping to dig one too one of these days, <laughs> for the return of the port and its inhabitants, or else he had burned the entire town to the ground. And to show he was confident, Morgan also sent the governor a pistol, declaring that it was so easy to take Porto Bello that he was already planning to return in a year to get his pistol back. The frightened governor paid the entire ransom, <laughs> and Captain Morgan's success in Porto Bello helped him recruit even more followers. Captain Morgan was a gener was generous to his men, but he popped out prisoners' eyeballs. Morgan always promised to reward his men for their service, and he was often more generous than the Royal Navy in sixteen in sixteen seventy as he planned the assault on Panama. Morgan drew up self governing self governing articles, essentially a contract with his followers. The captains of each ship would receive a hefty share of the treasure, while every man was covered by disability compensation in case they were harmed during the raid. The pirates could even get a bonus of 50 pieces of eight for bravery. Morgan only claimed 1% of the profits for himself, sharing generously with his men. But that generosity ended when it came to prisoners. Captain Morgan wasn't shy about using violence. If he needed information out of a prisoner, Captain Morgan would strap a leather cord around the person's head and tighten it with a metal bar until his eyeballs popped out. That sounds very painful. <laughs> Captain Morgan blew up his own ship to take a port. Captain Morgan's enemies always underestimated him. In 1669, he sailed seven ships to the Villanueva port of Maracaibo. Although they outnumbered the Spaniards, the Spanish flagship had more firepower than Morgan's entire fleet. But Captain Morgan still sent a demand for surrender to the Don Alazan Alonzo Don Alazan let me see Don Alonzo del Capio Y Espinanza. Okay. Who led the Spaniards. Espinosa Espinosa, excuse me. 
Espinoza would soon regret his choice to refuse. Morgan ordered his pirates to turn one of their seven ships into a fire ship. It was packed with explosives and aimed towards the Spaniards. Espinoza learned of the plan but dismissed it. That was his folly. He dismissed it, saying the pirates lacked the wit, uh-oh, for the advanced tactic. Double uh-oh. <laughs> but Morgan was willing to sacrifice one of his ships to take the port. He sent 12 men on the fire ship disguised with wooden guns and packed with explosives. At the last minute, they lit their own ship on fire and grappled directly to the Spanish flagship. Fire quickly spread in the Spanish ships, uh, and the pirates easily took Macaribo earning 250,000 pieces of eight in ransom money. Captain Morgan had no trouble rec recruiting followers. Captain Morgan was one of the most successful pirateers in history, and because his devilish raids were so profitable, men were lining up to join his brethren of the coast. By the raid on Portobello in 1668, the captain already had 500 followers. The next year, that number had risen to 650 men. And after taking 250,000 pieces of eight, Morgan had even more men eager to sail with him. After Maricabo, Morgan called for recruits. A stunning 2,000 men and 37 ships showed up at Tor Tortuga on October 24, 1670, eager to hear Captain Morgan's next target. Captain Morgan set his sights on Panama, the second largest city in the New World. After, success successful raid, after a successful raid in Portobello and Marcelo, Captain Morgan chose a new target, the second largest city in the New World, Panama. But it wouldn't be an easy target. Panama was the biggest city Captain Morgan had ever attempted to take. He was leading a much larger force of men than in his previous successful raids. And Panama was on the Pacific side of the Is Isthmus. So Morgan had to lead his men through the jungle before they could take the fortified city. The captain took about a thousand men on the dangerous journey and prepared his assault on the Spanish stronghold. In January of 1671, Captain Morgan reached the gates of Panama. He prepared for an assault on the city against the president of Panama, who led 1,200 men and 400 cavalry. The pirates won the Battle of Panama and even got a barbecue for their troubles. On January 26, 1671, Captain Morgan led the assault on Panama. His enemies had more men, 400 mounted fighters, and some oxen they planned to stampede stampede towards the pirates, but the Spanish cavalry was no match for Captain Morgan's sharpshooters. And when the Spanish infantry charged, Morgan quickly repelled them and turned the battle into a rout. Not even the oxen fazed the pirates. Most of the cattle simply ran away from the noisy battle, while the few that made it to the enemy side were easily killed. Morgan's men were starving after crossing through the jungles of Panama, and they slaughtered the oxen for a victory barbecue. At the end of the day, 500 Spaniards were killed, and Morgan only lost 15 of his men. One of Morgan's followers took a fort with a single arrow. In order to take Panama, Captain Morgan first had to capture a fort at the Charges River. It wasn't easy. The Spanish knew the pirates were coming. 
they were able to (coughs) double, (coughs) excuse me, they were able to double the garrison and increase the number of guns before Morgan could strike. (coughs) The frontal assault against the walls was going badly until one of Morgan's men changed the entire battle with a single arrow. Author Alex S. Esquire Milling wrote that the man struck by an arrow was so angry that he pulled the arrow from his body, wrapped it in a burning rag, and shot it back at the Spanish using his musket. The burning arrow struck the Spanish store of gunpowder, blowing it up and causing quite ruin, great ruin and no less consternation to the Spaniards. Because that one piece of luck, Morgan's men were able to take the fort. Captain Morgan's pirates controlled the Caribbean. Captain Morgan became the leader of a group of pirates called the Brethren of the Coast, and they completely dominated the Caribbean. These are the real Caribbean pirates. The, the um, brethren sprang up around 1618 during the Thirty Years' War. The Spanish used their rich territories in the Caribbean to fund the war effort, so their European rivals, the Dutch and English, encouraged private captains to attack Spanish ships. By the time that Captain Morgan led the brethren, they had bases, bases all across the Caribbean in Tortuga, Port Royal, and Nassau. The Brethren raided Spanish ships, halting the flow of gold and silver to Spain and making themselves rich in the process. And during their decades of dominating the Caribbean, they helped develop the Pirate Code, which would (coughs) define pirate life for centuries. The King of England knighted Captain Morgan, even though he was a war criminal. Captain Morgan was a privateer, which meant he had official sanction from the English to raid the Spanish during times of war. When the two nations were at peace, Morgan was supposed to stand down. However, during his most famous attack, when Morgan took Panama, the Spanish had already signed a peace treaty with England. Officially, Captain Morgan was an illegal pirate committing war crimes. When Captain Morgan returned to Jamaica after taking Panama, the governor arrested him, and Morgan was sent to England to stand trial. But Morgan was treated like a celebrity, and even though the Spanish were furious, King Charles II knighted Captain Morgan in 1674. The captain eventually returned to Jamaica, where he served as acting governor for several years. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> captain Morgan was the inspiration for Captain Blood. Captain Morgan's reputation was so powerful that he is considered one of the greatest pirates in history, even though he was technically a privateer rather than a pirate. In 1922, Raphael Sambertini even based his famous Captain Blood on Captain Morgan's life. But Morgan only spent part of his life as a privateer. After the successful raid on Panama, he retired from piracy, devoting the rest of his life to Jamaica. By then, Morgan had used much of his wealth to buy up land on the island, and he served as lieutenant governor and acting governor of the island until his death in 1688. He was so loved by the English that he was given a state funeral. Captain Morgan was able to use his brutal brutal but clever tactics to turn himself into a respectable landowner, proving that he was also one of history's most brilliant pirates. Captain Morgan's epic life apparently inspired the Seagram Company. 
So how did Captain Morgan become associated with one of the most popular brands of spirits in the United States? The Seagram Company began using the, his name in 1944, and Captain Morgan's original spiced rum didn't reach the U.S. until 1984. Since then, it has become a quintessential brand, especially among college students in the spring break crowd. Still, it's pretty bizarre that Captain Morgan became the inspiration for Captain Morgan's rum. The real Captain Morgan was incredibly strategic and used his years of piracy to propel himself into the richest classes of society. As Graham Thomas explains, Morgan was a planner, a brilliant military strategist, and intentionally loyal to the king, to England, and to Jamaica. But he also established himself as a politician and proponent of peaceful trade, leaving behind piracy for life as a rich, respected landowner. Most folks who consume Captain Morgan on a regular basis are unlikely to possess the brilliance and strategy, strategy of the man on the bottle. <laughs> Hope y'all enjoyed that. I sure did. And stay tuned for the uh, mail call next. See ya. All right, time for the mail call from Mary Kay's Treasures. I know how much you love milk glass. Yes, I do. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. I wanted to send you this small gift. I hope you like it. I just wanted to say thank you for your support to me and my channel. I pray you have a blessed rest of the year. Thank you, Mary Kay's Treasures. Thank you, Mary Kay, and we will see what she sent. Cause I, I haven't, I just opened it. I haven't seen what's in it yet. All right. This is beautiful. This little um, milk glass right here. It's um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get the uh, magnifying glass, or you can, because um, I can't see it, but. It's very nice. It's got a very nice label, and I hope y'all can see it. Maybe y'all can see it. I can't. I'll have to get the magnifying, get up and get the magnifying glass. I'm too lazy to get up right now. But uh, very nice. Thank you very much. That that is beautiful. And uh, she's got some more stuff in there too. <laughs> Oh, we got this little velvet sack right here. Velvet bag. Let's see what's in here. I like that velvet bag, too. Oh, look at that, y'all. Now that, I'll wear that. Yes, I will. That That is very nice right there. She makes jewelry from um, glass shards. And that is very pretty. I will wear that definitely. <laughs> that is beautiful. And I think she's got some more in here. Got something right here. Woman of God. 
Yeah, I like that too. That's a nice pen. Let's see. They that uh, wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not and not faint. I like that. It's from Isaiah 40, 31. So I like that right there. That is nice. And you can tell she wrote woman of God because it would come with a man. But I am a woman, woman of God. I am a woman of God. And that is beautiful. Thank you, Mary. And also, he got something right here. Oh, another milk glass. And I think this is uh, one she dug. I think it's one she dug. I found one on her channel. And it says um, ponds right there on the bottom. So a nice milk glass jar. Thank you, Mary. I love it all. Thank you very much. All right, y'all. See you later.